السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك على أشرف المخلوقين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Last session we tried to answer to this question about the four Imams, Al-Aymatul Arba'a, and why there are four Imams. And then we said, let's take one by one. And we had a small introduction about Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Just to go very quick over that again. We said that Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, was the very first Imam. It doesn't mean that there was no Imam before him. There was many Imams, which is his teacher also, they were A'imma. And of course, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, and all that. But he was the Imam who established the very first madrasa, the very first school of fiqh, which is we'll see it today, inshallah. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah was born on AD Hijriya. AD, eight zero. So eight years after Hijra, Imam Abu Hanifa was born. And he passed away 150 Hijriya, which is he lived around 70 years. Right. Now, there's one issue that a lot of people talk about right? that was Imam Abu Hanifa a tabi'i? You know where's a tabi'i? A tabi'i is a person who had the chance to see the Sahaba, one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. We actually can say that Imam Abu Hanifa in his time, when he was born, when he was a child, probably six or seven years old, some of the Sahaba were still alive. Especially Anas ibn Malik, because he's the one who lived more than any other Sahaba. But Imam Abu Hanifa at that time he was probably a child of six or seven or eight years old. And definitely he did not hear anything from Imam from Anas ibn Malik. Definitely. And we will see why, subhanAllah. Anyway, Imam Abu Hanifa was born in Al Kufa, a city of Kufa. And the city of Kufa at that time was like the heart of the Muslims' world. Why? Because Imam Ali. When he became the Khalifa, he moved the capital from Medina to Al Kufa for many reasons. We are not to discuss that, but the Kufa at that time was like the center of the world, of the Islamic world. What I would say, even the center of the whole world. It says that the Masjid of the Kufa, the Mosque of the Kufa, the big one, at that time, at that time, could fit for around 40,000 Muslims. You can imagine that. So the Kufa was not a small city, was not a small village, was something huge, was something big. Why? Because many people from different ethnicity, like from the Persian, from the Romans, from whatever you can say, all of them, they were coming to Al Kufa. Why? Because it was the capital, right? And Imam Ali, radiallahu anhu, he stayed there for many, many, many years, subhanAllah. One thing also very important, when we say, for example, Ali ibn Abi Talib was there, it means that Ali ibn Abi Talib had the chance to give lectures there, to give khutbahs there, right, to give his knowledge over there. So the school established there, or the people that used to listen, used to listen from the ilm of Ali ibn Abi Talib, which is, was one of the greatest khulafa when it comes to knowledge. SubhanAllah, if you want to name them, the khulafa or the sahaba that they had the knowledge a lot, I can say Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, Abdullah ibn Umar. These are the scholars of the, subhanAllah, the scholars of the Sahaba. Why I mention that? Ali radiallahu anhu, once he moved back to Medina for whatever, he actually left behind him Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. We may say a little bit about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Rasulullah said about him, Wi'a'un mulia'ilma. He's like a container full of knowledge. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, one time he said, Subhanallah, one time he said about himself, Wallahi, inni akhattu sab'ina suratan min fi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I swear by Allah that I took 70 surah, 70 surahs from the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I do understand it with the meaning, interpretation, and the tafsir and everything. So you can imagine who is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So the madrasa of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was also where? In Kufa. So this is the place where Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu is going to be raised and he's going to be taught by many of the scholars, subhanAllah. Now, 
about Imam Abu Hanifa, the starting of Imam Abu Hanifa, I'll just say something about it, especially for the young people. Imam Abu Hanifa was a very challenging person. He doesn't like to be number two. He likes to be always number one. An A plus student. He cannot be an A minus or A, mi a student, no. He has to be an A plus student, meaning all the time on the top. In the beginning of his life, he was not raised like the other three Imams, like Imam Malik and Shafi'i and Ahmed, meaning he did not go to classical schools to learn about the fiqh and about the ilm. No, he did not. Probably when he was a child, he went and he probably memorized the Quran, but that's it. His father was a, a good merchant, a businessman, and he had a store. In his store, he used to sell fabrics and athwab, you know, clothes and all that. So he used to go with his father all the time and he learned from his father. At the age of 17, right? Still Imam Abu Hanifa was not into the ilm and all those things, into the business, subhanAllah. But he was not satisfied. This man was, like I said, he was an A plus student. He was not satisfied with the business of his father. So he asked his father, I want to develop your business. So he said, okay. His father was actually a very understanding person. He said, yes. So he was able to develop the business of his father that that small store becomes the best of all the stores in the Kufa. The quality, the types of clothes and everything. So, and he just in a couple of years, probably when he was 19 years old, he became one of the richest people, the richest merchant in the city of Kufa. So you can imagine who is this man, Abu Hanifa. So he just want to be on the top. But one turning point is going to happen in the life of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. That one time he was, he was actually passing by and a scholar, his name is a Shabi. Shabi is a very, very big scholar and Imam. If we study the fiqh, we're going to read a lot about him and about his Messiah and all that. But Imam a Shabi he saw him and he spoke to him and he told him, Imam uh, takhtalif. You go to who? To learn. You say, I go to, and actually he, he is probably you go to learn, to learn about business. Because by the way, subhanAllah, something that I probably forgot. Uh, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, when he wants to develop his, the business of his father, he did not just go like, do it. But he went to found a teacher, which is he's good in teaching about business, just like now we go to colleges and schools. And he went and he learned from him, the basic of the business. So that's why he was able to do it. So that Imam al-Sha'bi, when he asked him, he said, I go to certain, certain, he said, no, no, I'm not asking you about that. I'm asking you about ilm, the shari ilm. He said, no, I don't. I don't really have a, like I go for whatever, for prayer, for so and so. He said to him, uh, I think business is not going to satisfy you. I see in you so much, uh, let's say, hayawiya, energy. And I see in your eyes so much uh, intelligence. So business is not going to be enough for you. Why don't you try to learn about the ilm al-shari? It looks like that is what to the heart of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. From the next day, he went actually to find who is actually the teacher that I could, could, could go to. And he heard about a teacher, his name is uh, Hamad ibn Sulaiman, a very famous scholar at that time. He went to Hamad and he said, I want to learn from you, subhanAllah. Hamad, said to him, yes, I agree, but you will learn from me every day, only three, three questions, three times every day, and then stay in your business. And actually, he actually the understood, say, I should keep my business because I'm a very good businessman, and that could help me also for the ilm shari, which is, we will see that. So I started going to Hamad, and he stayed with him. Guess what? He's going to stay with him 18 years to learn from Hamad. 18 years, subhanAllah, to learn from Hamad. And after a while, looks like some friendship was developed between Hamad ibn Sulaiman and Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. He is going to become the smartest students of Hamad. That Hamad will start bringing him very close to him. You know, it comes to the students, always the smartest students will be coming closer to the teacher. After a while, he starts selling clothes to him on his side. He was learning from Hamad, and he would never miss even one class. 
But something very amazing about this man, subhanAllah, when he was discussing with Hamad, he has so much respect for his teacher that he said, I, was, I used to be very afraid even to turn the pages of my papers not to disturb my teacher, Hamad. One time also he said, Wallahi, by Allah, I make dua for Hamad for every single prayer before I make dua for my father and my mom because he's the one who taught me. And then he also said, Abu Hanifa, it's just something amazing. One time he said, Wallahi, inni, by Allah, I make dua for the people who taught me and for the people that I taught. So they asked him for the people that, you know, they, they were teaching you, we understand. But for the people that you are teaching, he said, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep them on the right path, so I will always get the reward from them also. SubhanAllah. Going back again, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, just like any human, he was very honest to himself about this point. So one time, after probably a couple of years, after 10 years exactly, after 10 years of you know the classes of Hamad, I want to be also Ra'is, I want to be the Imam, I want to be the one who gives the lecture, I want to sit and give have my halaqa. It's a human feeling, subhanAllah. So he was thinking about it, I'm going to go today, and I'm going to go on the side, and I'm going to have my own halaqa, subhanAllah. So once he went to the masjid, and he saw his teacher, he couldn't. He felt a little bit embarrassed, I'm not going to do this. I mean, so what he did, he joined his he joined his teacher and he was listening to him. But look again, the conscience of this uh, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. He said, on that day, I felt so guilty that I couldn't sit on his side, so I went to the back. Like he's punishing himself for what he was thinking. But an incident is going to happen on that day. It looks like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes the aspect. He said, on that day, when he was about to do that, to spoil this beautiful relation between him and Hamad, by the way, uh, Abu Hanifa, once he got a son, he named him Hamad also for the name of his teacher. On that day, subhanAllah, Hamad, he received a letter from somebody from Al-Basra. They told him, somebody passed away, you got to come and get your inheritance, your earth. So what he did when he got the letter, he said to Abu Hanifa, you take my place until I come back. SubhanAllah. So Abu Hanifa, he said there. He was somehow, looks like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he prepared me for this. So he took the place of, subhanAllah, of Hamad. And he stayed, I think for almost a month or two months. So, and he was, whenever some masail, people were coming to him, asking masail, fatwas and questions, he used to answer to them for whatever he learned, subhanAllah. When Hamad came back, he actually found Abu Hanifa, already wrote all those masail, and he was discussing with him. And then you know what? Hamad, he agreed with him in some and he disagreed with him on some. But still he was his student and there was no problem. It's not like because I have a different opinion, I'm going to be against you. No, it's not. So they agree and they disagree. And still that love still continued between them. And still Hamad, still Abu Hanifa was the student of Hamad. You know, uh, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah was telling us some stories about those things. It was just so beautiful when you read about these people. He said, I used to love the ilm. That you know what, the best time for us, after all the other students, they will go home. Or you know what, we ask our teacher to stay with us, which is Hamad, after Salat al Isha. And then we continue our classes, our extra classes, just talking and discussing. We have mistakes, we have questions, and go and go and go. And then, you know, the teacher also wants to go home. So he used to tell them, okay, we will stop the class when we hear the adhan of the rooster, you know, so the rooster, the dig. So when the early morning, they may say so once the adhan, once we heard the rooster, we stop the class. It says that Abu Hanifa used to hate that rooster because because of him we have to stop the class. And one time he said to his teacher, this rooster is not making the adhan a proper time. He's actually a liar. That's what he said, subhanAllah. Like, that's not the right adhan, and then we'll come after. Subhanallah. That's how much Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he loved the ilm. And that's how much he was so excited about the ilm. Now Abu Hanifa, um, Abu 
Hamadi is going to pass away. By the way, just to let you know also, once Hamad, rahimahullah, this teacher of Abu Hanifa, he came back and he was asking him a question and all that. The, <laughs> he went home first. So his son, the son of Hamad, asked his father, Hamad, what did you miss? The most, the most thing that you missed. He said, I missed Abu Hanifa. He missed his students, subhanAllah, to come and he liked him. They developed this kind of love between both of them, subhanAllah. And the, you know, this story is going to happen to the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, which is Imam Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, one of the greatest students and scholars in the Qudat. It says Imam Abu Yusuf, which is, is going to become Qadil Qudat, the judge of all the judges at that time. And he became very, very rich because of that position that he had in the Abbasid time. Uh, probably, he had probably billions of dinars if you want. And when he was dying, they asked him, what is your wish? you have any wish? He said, one jalsa of Abu Hanifa. To have one jalsa with Imam Abu Hanifa, which is his student, who is his uh, teacher who already passed away. Going back now to Abu Hanifa, to understand the fiqh of Abu Hanifa, and to understand what Abu Hanifa did. Once Abu Hanifa became the scholar, the Imam of that halaqa, he wants to do some change. So he is not now a teacher like all the other teachers, but he was actually to change the whole format of that. So what he did exactly? He was looking in every single field, someone who is very genius, in Quran, in Tafsir, in medical, in engineering, and so on, so on, so on. He called all of them to join his halaqa. So there were 40 people, 40 people. That's the base of the halaqa of Imam Abu Hanifa. And of course, there were hundred and thousand people that used to join. But these are the, the base, the pillars of the halaqa of Abu Hanifa. Among them was Abu Yusuf, wa Zufar, wa Abu Hassan, and all these people. So what's the style of Abu Hanifa? How he used to teach and how he used to do the things? He was not a dictator teacher, somehow. But he used to put it this way. They will bring a mas'ala, an issue, a question, then he will say, okay, let's try to find the answer. So he will just ask the question. And then each one of the people will make his own answer. Uh, I think it's this way, I think it's this way, I think it's this way. And then they keep discussing, discussing probably sometimes for a day or two or three. Then they got to the answer. And then once they got the answer, there was someone who write everything, the whole discussion and all the answer, and the answer is based on what? So that's why when we study the fiqh of the Ahnaf, we can always to look why this mas'ala is in this way, why the answer is in this way, because of so, so, and so, and so. Anyway, going back again. So Imam Abu Yusuf was the writer of all those mas'ala, what it happened in the fiqh and all that. Subhanallah. And that's why some of these scholars they said something very interesting about this. Imam Sufyan al thawri Sufyan al thawri one of the greatest scholars again and the pious people in the Islamic history. So one time he was talking to someone and then that person he said, Imam Abu Hanifa qad akhta. He made a mistake in this one. Sufyan al thawri said something amazing. He said, لا أن He cannot make a mistake. So that guy said, well, he is not a Muslim that you are not going to make a mistake. He said, no, because Imam Abu Hanifa, our Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he does not give his own opinion. This is the opinion of 40 people that they discussed it and discussed it, then they came to a conclusion. So that's how that answer came. I'm just saying this. It doesn't mean that it's out of question, okay? It's out of question. Nobody make it. Everybody may make a mistake, even a hundred people. But just the base that he was not just given an opinion like that. It is the opinion discussed and discussed and discussed from who? The cream of that society at that time that they will come to the answer, subhanAllah. So this is how it used to be. Imam Abu Hanifa also, he used to choose his students. Just like the example of Imam Abu Yusuf. Imam Abu Yusuf, he was not a rich man. He was from a very poor family. So he used to join, when he was a young man, he used to join the halaqa of Abu Hanifa. His mom told him, look, don't go to Abu Hanifa. He's a rich man, and this job is not going to help you. So what he did, he stopped coming, or he's not coming regularly. So Abu Hanifa asked him, subhanAllah, why you're not coming? He said, because my parents told me that I have to make some my life. So he said to him, hey, okay, from tomorrow, you come and you join us. And then he gave him some money. I think it's around like 20 dinars or 20 dirhams. And he said, once this one finished, I will give you another one. So, it's, you remember, now, in our daily life, we talk about scholarship. 
So Imam Abu Hanifa, at that time, he started giving scholarship to his own students. SubhanAllah, out of his business that he was making a lot. By the way, Imam Abu Hanifa used to make a lot of money. It says around like 200,000 dinars a year. But they said this money never stays in his hand. Some of them they went, to, they went to such an exaggeration that they said he never gives zakat. Uh -oh, what do you mean he never say? That means the money never stay in his balance, in his bank account, that he would have the nisab to give the zakat. Whatever money comes to his hand, he will give it to the poor people. He will, and actually he used to spend a lot of money on himself also. Nice clothes, nice this. He likes to look nice. He likes to wear very expensive clothes and all that. Anyway. But this is the style of Abu Hanifa, such a generous person that you cannot even imagine. Such a very shy person also, an honest person, a modest person. But moving back to the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, I, I said that the, the base of the fiqh of Abu Hanifa is what? Because somebody came and asked him, If there is a question now that you've been asked, what do you do? First, I look to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I find the answer in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will answer. If you don't find in the book of Allah, in the sunnah of Rasulullah then I will find in the aqdiya, in the qada, in the fatawa of Abu Bakr wa Umar wa Uthman wa Ali or the other sahaba. Up to this part, up to this part, the base, the book, Quran, Sunnah and the Sunnah of the Sahaba, all the all the madahib, all the madahib, the Maliki, the Shafi'i, the Hanbali, now the Hanafi, all of them they agree on the same base that any issue has to be according first to the book Sunnah and then if it's not you go to the same of the Sahaba. Then they said if you don't, qala ajtahidu bi ra'i wa la ad. Then in, if I don't find, I will try to try to make the find a way my opinion i can use my aql and then he said but if i find something from the tabi'in like an opinion of some of the tabi'in could be a zuhri or somebody else he said their opinion is the same like mine they are rijal they are men and we are men also so i could also so he said the book of allah of course i cannot deny it the, uh, the, the hadith i cannot deny it the saying and the doing of the Sahaba, I cannot neglect it. When it comes to anybody else, he put himself on the same level like the others. In this issue, he differentiates from the other madaib, which is will, inshallah, study about the Malikiyah or the uh, Hanabila or the Shafi'iyah. Going back again to the Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, we may say, what is the difference between these two madaib and how is it like this, subhanAllah? I would say, the time of Abu Hanifa and the place of Abu Hanifa was completely different than the time and the place of any other Imam. Especially Imam Malik rahimahullah, because they both of them they lived in the same time but in different place. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he lived in Kufa. Imam Malik rahimahullah, he lived in Medina in the same time. And that's where we call the two schools, the school of Hijaz, which is the school of Medina, and the school of Iraq, which is the school of Kufa. And then they have some differences and some fighting and some disputes. Now you may tell me why it is the difference between these two. If you are telling me both of them, they follow this and that and that. Yes, because the masail, the new issues, the new problems that the people were facing in Iraq, they were not facing in Medina. In, in, in Medina, they are the Sahaba and Abna al Sahaba. And the issues and the problems, they were different than the problem that is happening in Iraq, in Kufa, in Basra. The new ethnicity, the new converted, the, the, the. So the problems that were coming were completely different. It did not happen in the time of the Sahaba. It did not happen in the time of the Tabi'een. And in Medina, those problems were not happening. So Imam Abu Hanifa, he needs to develop a fiqh that will satisfy our answer to all the new questions and the all new challenges that the Muslims were facing. And that's why he had to use his opinion, his qiyas, what we say, the qiyas, to see the ahkam of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Sahaba and try to do the qiyas, to try to find an opinion closer to those 
opinions or to those saying of the Sahaba and so on and so on. Because of this issue, he would have a lot of problems that he would be facing. A lot of problems that he would be facing among the people. That I, I will tell you one of them, which is amazing also. One of his, one of his students, which is, uh, I think, Ibn al-Mubarak, he was a good student of him. But actually one time, he went actually, and he heard one of the scholars saying bad things about a big scholar, but he doesn't know Abu Hanifa, he heard about him. He heard that Abu Hanifa does this, and he is his aqli, neglect the, the denies the ahadith, he, 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 which is, some of us also, they think about it, and then they read it in some books, and so on, so So he was saying those things. But this man, he was really smart. The way to introduce Abu Hanifa to this scholar. So he said to him, I have some of the Masai, some of the Masai which Abu Hanifa used to say, some of the questions in the fatawa, and I would like you to read it. So he gave it to him, and he didn't tell him Abu Hanifa or anything. So he gave it to him. So he started reading, say, this is amazing. Again, again, and again, and again. He couldn't stop reading. Say, Hada fiqhun ajib. This is amazing fiqh. Then he said, Liman had. This is belongs to who? Qala lil Nu'man ibn Thabi. This is to the Nu'man ibn Thabi, which is the other name of Abu Hanifa. He said, This is a big scholar. I don't see anyone like him. Say, Hada Abu Hanifa. This is Abu Hanifa. That man, he said, I heard something completely different. So he said, from now, now I understand. He said, Ilzam, stay with this man and keep learning from this man. So this is one of the shahada, one of the saying of the people at that time. I will just add one more thing, inshallah, and we'll close the session of today, inshallah. Abu Hanifa in, uh, in Kufa, he had many challenges that he had to face. And like I said, it's not like in Medina. The, in, in, uh, in Kufa, there was many, uh, new, uh, even the Firaq, the groups, like you're talking about Mu'tazila, you're talking about Asha'ira, you're talking about uh, Murji'a, you're talking about Khawarij, you're talking about Shia, you're talking about all of them. They used to be in Iraq. Their cells they used to be in Iraq. And uh, he has to face all of them. And he will have to challenge all of them. And he has also not to pick a fight with any of them. It is actually a style of living with the others and trying to accept the others, but at the same time you keep your identity. It is a way how you can, you can have a dialogue, a discussion with the others, and how you can also convince them, or at least you can have a conversation with them. I, I will just give one simple example. Uh, you know, in Kufa, especially, there used to be a lot of Shia, or there used to be a lot of people that used to be supporters of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And those, some of them, they used to go to the extent that they love Ali so much, I'm not talking about Shia, but they used to hate Uthman because of the tahkim and all that. So Abu Hanifa he heard about one of them, that he was saying this, that Uthman was a kafir, Uthman was this, Uthman was that. He said many bad things about Uthman. But look how Abu Hanifa is going to solve this problem, which is we'll see many examples of this just to have an understanding how Abu Hanifa used to solve the problem. Abu Hanifa, all what he did, he went to the house of that person. And that person, he knew Abu Hanifa very well. He knew that he's the Imam. And by the way, I forgot to tell you that Abu Hanifa has two titles. They call him uh, Al Imam Al A'dam and also Imam Al A'imma. Another one who was called Imam Al A'imma, Ibn Khuzayma, but that's in Ulum Al Hadith. Going back again. So, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa went to the house of this person, he knocked the door. When that person uh, opened the door, he said to him, Atay took a khatiba. I'm coming for khitbah. What's khitbah? To ask for the marriage of your daughter. He said, Ahlul wa sahlan, you're all welcome. The Imam is coming. He said, no, no, it's not for me. But it's for somebody else. He said, okay. Who is that person? So he said to him, this person is a generous person. Very generous person. Oh, mashallah, of course. If he is from your side, of course I will accept. You see, this person is a very shy and modest person. You say, of course, he's from you. I will definitely accept him. This person he is and he has and he says so many qualities, <coughs> which is the qualities of Uthman. Then he said, 
oh, you don't keep, to, you keep telling me all this, okay, who is this? He said, but this man has only one little bad thing about him. He said, what is it? He said, he's a kafir. See, you man, you're asking me to give my daughter to someone who is a kafir? Would you really accept that? Imam Abu Hanifa answered to him, and he said to him, and let me tell you, do you think Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will give his two daughters to a kafir? Which is Uthman radiallahu anhu, right? He gave his two daughters, first one, right? Umm Kalsum, then uh, Ruqayya, or the opposite, Ruqayya and Umm Kalsum. And Uthman was generous, Uthman was hayy, was modest, with this and that. So he looked at him and said, I am very sorry for what I did, I'm very sorry for what I said. This is again the understanding of Imam Abu Hanifa when it comes to solving any issue. He will take it with some understanding, with some comprehension and all that, and then he will solve the problem. So inshallah, we'll stop over here and we'll continue next week inshallah. If you have any comments or questions. Okay. لا إله إلا الله له لا شريك له له الملك له الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير والمصير على كل شيء قدير ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله